So this is in the group of birds that we come here to see in the spring. It's one of the warblers. And we're going to go look at a poster that has all the warblers on it and see if we can figure out which one this is. This one might not surprise you that it's got a very good name compared to some of the others. It's the only one on this whole poster that's just black and white, and it's appropriately called the black and white warbler. Now the one on the poster has a white throat. That's because they're showing a female there. This is a male with a black throat. And you can see he's got a little bit of white mixed in with the black. So that tells me he's in his second calendar year. After their second calendar year, their throats are completely black. Now his beak is a little bit longer and a little bit more curved than some of the other warblers. And his toenails are a little bit longer too. And that's an adaptation to help him compete with all of these other warblers. So in the spring, 20 or 30 species of warbler can be seen in the same patch of woods. And they're all eating bugs. They're all competing for the same bugs. So how does this bird compete? With its longer beak and its longer toenails, it creeps around on branches upside down and it pokes inside the bark with its longer beak. And so none of the other warblers do that. Some of them, like the American Red Start up here, perches up high and it flies out and catches bugs in midair. And some others, like the Cape May warbler, pokes around in flowers and leaves. The worm-eating warbler, which is very rare, it likes to poke around in dead leaves dangling down for any insects that might be in there. And all of these warblers have a very slightly different foraging strategy that helps them uh, uh, in the competition for the spring bug hatch. And they're all adapted both physically and behaviorally um, to make their way and, and to, to uh, survive. So this is a second year male black and white warbler. We'll finish taking his measurements. is 69.5 and his tail is 50.5 does he have any body fat I don't really see any so he may have flown all night to get here and depleted all of his fat reserves so he's going to use the E.L. Johnson Nature Center as a refueling spot before he continues his migration. I don't know why. And he weighs 11.4 grams. So black and white warblers nest um, not too far north of, of southern Michigan. They nest up around Saginaw Bay and farther north, uh, all across Canada. And they spend the winter in the West Indies and the Caribbean and in Central America. They don't go quite as far south as some of the other warblers do. But he has still flown thousands of miles to get here. Likes my warm hand. So we've just banded this beautiful little bird. It's yet another one of our small, colorful birds with a thin bill for in eating insects. Let me hold its wings down so you can get a better look. 
You can see it has a lot of little whiskers at the base of the beak. This is one of the warblers. And the way it behaves is it likes to fly out and catch insects in midair. And so those whiskers help to guide the insects into its beak. And so other warblers feed in different ways. Some feed along branches, some pick out of leaves, and some pick them out of the bark. Uh, but this one feeds by flying out and catching them in midair. And it uses its tail spots, it flashes these tail spots to flush those insects into the air. Um, and so this one is called an American Red Start. And it's not red, but it, it's orange, but maybe the, the ornithologist who discovered it was colorblind, but there's also a European bird called a Red Start that has a similar tail, but it's not related. And it also flashes its tail open to flush insects. And this is a male American Red Start black with orange patches on the wing, on the sides of the breast, and on the tail. Uh, the female, and the American Red Star is shown right up here. The female uh, is mostly olive and gray where the male is black, and where the male is orange, the female, females are yellow. And these American Red Starts spend the winter in the Caribbean and in Central America. And one of the uh, recaptures we have here at the Nature Center is an American Red Start that uh, I banded in one year uh, in the spring. And two years later in the fall, uh, a bird bander in Ontario, about 250 miles northeast of here, caught her uh, in fall migration in September. So that's something very interesting we learn about birds is how long they live. Uh, that bird obviously survived its migration and uh, was headed back south. Um, she was also up near her nesting ground, so we, uh, we also tracked the direction she moved and how far she moved. Okay. So this little bird, I don't know if it's, can you see it well enough there? Or you want me to walk out into the sun with it? Mm -hmm. Walk out in the sun too. Come out into the sun. They're trying to stay in the shade. Small bird, smaller than a sparrow. Fine beak. Has a little bit, little whiskers around the base of the beak. And maybe you can see those. It's in the warbler group, so it's on our chart on the back. It has a black throat and a black cheek and it's blue on top. It's very appropriately named a black-throated blue warbler. And this one might be interesting to look at the migration map on the All About Birds site, on the eBird site. Most of the black-throated blue warblers in eastern North America spend the winter in the West Indies, in the Caribbean, a lot of them on Cuba and in Jamaica, a little bit on Puerto Rico. And so whenever the hurricanes come through, um, a lot of times these birds are not there yet, but sometimes they are. So they're, they're vulnerable to, uh, to the hurricanes that pass through the West Indies. But they nest in the Appalachians and uh, northern Michigan, uh, east to New England. And so it's an eastern nesting warbler. And another field mark, the female is green without the black throat, but she has this white mark on the wing. So that's a white wing patch. And I can tell that this is a, an after second year male. It's after its second calendar year. I'm looking at these little feathers on the outer side here. They've got a little blue edge on them. The ones in their second calendar year are green there. So sometimes it's very small things that we look at to tell how old they are. So most of the warblers that we see here and that are on this poster nest north of us. Um, this one doesn't nest all that far north. Uh, a lot of these are 
uh, nesting in coniferous woods, spruce woods and pine woods in the great boreal forest of Canada, but this one nests in mixed deciduous and uh, coniferous, so in the transition. Uh, so you can find black-throated blue warblers in the lower peninsula of Michigan as well as in the upper peninsula. Um, there are some southern warblers, uh, like the hooded warbler and the Kentucky warbler, are more southern species and deciduous, but most of these are uh, boreal forest nesting birds. So this bird has flown up here from the West Indies and it's probably got a couple hundred miles to go maybe to its nesting range. And it's ready to go, I think. Out here in the sun. This is a bird that we catch pretty much every year, but it can be a little bit difficult to figure out what it is. If we look at its field marks, look at its size, the size is about as big as a sparrow, but it's got a thinner beak than a sparrow would. It's not thick and triangular. It has a little bit of color up on its crown. And it's basically olive green on top with a bunch of black spots on the undersides. And it's got fairly big legs, which is a good indication of, of what adaptations it has. This is in the group of warblers, which are usually smaller than this and more colorful than this, and spend their time up in trees. But this is a ground-dwelling species of warbler, uh, and they do go up into trees, but they build their nests on the ground at the base of a shrub, and it's built in a dome shape um, out of sticks and twigs and things and it resembled uh, an old-fashioned brick oven. And so the name of this bird is oven bird, uh, even though it's a warbler. And it is, on the, it is on the chart back here, if I can find it quickly. Um, it's actually right here. And so you can see that some of the things match. It's got the little uh, black and white stripes on the t crown with the orange in the middle. It's got the big white ring of feathers around the eye and then you see the black stripes here. Now this illustration shows it with its crest raised. They usually do that when they're, they're uh, agitated with something. And so these birds nest uh, here in, in Oakland County, but not at the E.L. Johnson Nature Center because they require a lot of habitat. It's what we call an area sensitive species. So they need a lot of acres of, of really nice rich woods to nest in. Um, and there isn't enough of that here. The, the E.L. Johnson Nature Center is about 40 acres and about half of that is our pond. Um, so if you go out to the Highland Recreation Area or um, Indian Springs Metro Park, you probably see, or at least hear, oven birds. And they spend the winter in the tropics, uh, in the West Indies and in Central America. This one I can tell is in its second calendar year because it has these little spots on these feathers here. Those are retained juvenile feathers. So it only has those when it's a juvenile and it, these are left over from last year. And so it's in its second calendar year. We can't tell males from females this time of year. Okay, the wing is 73.5. I do have a cheat sheet for some of these. Um, some individuals, you can tell the males from the females by how long the wing is. 
so oven bird less than 69 is female more than 77 is male and so we had 73.5 so it's still unknown because it's in the overlap zone tail is 56 writing better so that I can read it when I get home. It's always good to take field notes, but it's even better if you can read them. <laughs> it does have a little bit of fat. Sweatshirt makes a good background. And this one sings a really, really loud song. It sings, Teacher, 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 Teacher. So if you, when we were looking at the uh, songbirds in a previous lesson, um, this was probably not one of the birds that you looked up, but you can go on to xenocanto.org and look up oven bird. And then you can listen to its song. And this bird is ready to go. So it, travel, it traveled up here from its uh, wintering grounds, which was in the West Indies or in Central America, so it's, it has probably flown a couple thousand miles to get here, and great catbirds do nest on the property here at the Yale Johnson Nature Center, so this could be one of our local birds, or it could be a bird that goes a little farther north. They do nest um, a little bit north of the Upper Peninsula, north of Lake Superior, uh, so this might not be its final destination. beautiful white-throated sparrow go. You can go now. <laughs> it's ready to go. Hold out your hand. Ha, 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 ha. 